It's only sport with Martin Devlin on the platform. Brought to you by One New Zealand. Let's get connected. Devlin Untamed. Welcome to the Highlights Package, people. We call it a podcast, iOS, it's only sport. Martin Devlin, Lachlan, war today, America's Cup. So where are we at? What have we learned so far? What do we expect in the next few weeks? And who's most likely to be our ultimate challenger? Peter Lester from America's Cup TV. You'll know Peter. He's been over the America's Cup, every single edition of it since 1987. And he provides brilliant analysis, especially about where we're gaining speed, he believes. No cricket overnight again. Basketball scenes yesterday. Afghanistan, New Zealand, two days, no play. As the ground staff did their darndest to try and dry the sodden outfield. It really was a comedy show, only not really funny if you wanted some cricket, not funny at all for the players. We caught up with Aaron Gates on the show, New Zealand Sportsman of the Year, 2023, multi-Commonwealth Games winning gold medalist. Now got his dream job signed for Astana, and he can ride the Grand Tours. That means Spain, that means the Giro, that means... The Tour de France. Miles Davis won all with Mexico, the all whites. Miles watched that game, so did we. His thoughts on it. Look, if you're a New Zealand football fan, a fan of our national team, you'd take that every day of the week. It was a bit like Slovakia in the 2010 World Cup, where we spent 91 minutes kicking the ball into touch. We just kicked it out. Just what else did we do? We had no tactics, just kicked the ball out. Then all of a sudden, Shane Smells crossed it. Winston Reid, yeah! That was a bit like that. Just the flukiest goal ever. But when you're 94th in the world and that team's 19th, one all draw, that's the best result for our national men's football team. Well, since you tell me a better one. As well as that, what is more chance of happening? We did the Tide Five. Brendan Telfer joined us and Mark Watson, episode 99 of the ATM podcast. Mark just back from the Paralympics, his best moments and what he loved the most about it. All of that. We begin the show the same way every day, though. Tablets in hand, I say gather my flock. It is time for a sermon and a day of reflection. This has got nothing to do with sport. Let's go to the mountaintop. We live in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots. Today is September the 11th, in New Zealand, that is. 9-11 day is tomorrow in the US of A because of the time zone. 23 years ago, the world's most infamous terrorist attack took place across New York City, Washington, D.C., and Pennsylvania. We all know what happened, the JFK moment of our generation, the moon landing moment, the where were you and what were you doing at that moment moment. And it changed our world forever. What were you doing? Who were you with? How did you find out? And can you remember what your reaction was, what you did, who you spoke to, how you felt? Me, I was in bed asleep at home. We had had our firstborn in May, so Charlie was barely four months old. The phone went off in the middle of the night, something like 2 a.m., and a mate in London rang to say, turn the TV on. I was like, what the hell, dude? Well, what are you doing? It's the middle of the night. Turn the TV on, CNN, just do it. So we did. And about 10 minutes later, the second plane hit the South Tower live on the TV. Myself and my then wife, Andy, had stood at the top of that tower just eight years earlier. On a rare, windless day in New York, you could get out there and we took pictures of each other with a camera because you didn't have cell phones back then. We still have those photos. I went into work at Radio Sport And we phoned as many New Zealand athletes and correspondents as we knew that were in those places, New York, D.C. We spoke to Ryan Nelson, who was playing for D.C. United at the time, and he'd been stopped on the way to training because plane three had hit the Pentagon. I remember feeling totally shell-shocked, disbelieving, numb almost, like, is this really happening? And it felt like that for days, weeks even. And everyone that you'd bump into would have the same reaction and the same expression. Forever changed our world, how we travel especially. With all the security that's in place now, it's such a hassle these days. It all happened because of that day, 9-11. It's incredibly sobering, incredibly sad, and it's a collective global experience, and that's very rare, something that happens that almost every single person in the world was aware of and probably felt the same thing at the same time. It was a real moment in time, and a moment that none of us will ever forget because it's a moment that you just you just can't forget. <laughs> Devlin. What do you want? We want information. Information. You won't get it. The platform. 
get to the news. I'll start off with some live sport. A big result and a bit of a surprise for the All Whites who have held the United States to a 1 1 draw in the international football friendly in Cincinnati. Uh, this one off cricket test between the Black Caps and Afghanistan has turned into an absolute joke. No play was possible once again with not a ball being bowled on day two. In Greater Noida, India. And just like day one, not a single drop of rain fell, but residual water from weather overnight was enough to see conditions considered too dangerous to begin. Uh, Scottish rugby legend Stuart Hogg has been arrested for a third time this year over stalking allegations. This just days after scoring in his comeback game in the top 14. Aston Martin have confirmed the signing of legendary F1 designer Adrian Newey as managing technical partner uh, and a shareholder of the team. Former Tottenham and Chelsea boss Mauricio Pochettino has been named as the new manager of the USA, their men's team. He was in attendance in that game today against the All Whites. The NFL says that it will review the latest sexual assault allegation made against Cleveland Browns quarterback Deshaun Watson. If you want to know the checkered recent past about Deshaun Watson, just search up his name and search up the word massage. You'll find plenty about it. Uh, and finally, some great news around the women's Warriors team who will re-enter the NRLW next year. They've made a signing, their first signing, fullback Arpi Nichols. She was a foundation player for the Warriors women's side in 2018, making six appearances for the club before they exited the competition four years ago. But she's back in a Warriors jumper. Uh, that's what's making news, Martin. Devlin. Yes! Yes! Can we do it? The Platform. The America's Cup, Louis Vuitton... Now, next step as we gear towards October the 12th when the actual cup gets competed for between us, Team New Zealand, and whoever it is. Who is that going to be? Is it going to be Luna Rossa? Are they the hot favourites? Is it going to be Britain? Peter Lester from America's Cup TV and a figure well known to anyone who's ever watched any America's Cup on the TV here in New Zealand. His analysis of this is absolutely expert. I hope you enjoy. Peter, we're set for the semi-finals now. So one has dropped out. We've got four to go. And from these, uh, this will lead us to the LV, which has got two. And then we, of course, play the winner of that. Is essentially in a summation, is that what's happening? Yep, yep, you're on the button. That's exactly right. So come Friday, um, the, the thing that will happen first up is the, the winner from the round robins selects who they want to race against. Um, so that will mean Ineos. Uh, ben Ainsley, he will select one of the other three teams uh, for that semi-final. And the other important thing that comes up, the winner from the round robins, they select what um, side of the start line they get. Now, the, the, the advantage side is when they come in on port, um, that, that first entry, they're in there 10 seconds before the, um, the boat on the other side. So that, that happens on Friday. Okay, uh, and so what you've seen so far, uh, you know, how how much can we glean from 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 the from the racing in terms of who is better, who is faster, and obviously, you know, who is going to be playing off for the Louis Vuitton? Um, well, there's been a bit of a change of the deck chairs, really, uh, and the talking points would be the the improvement of Ineos Britannia from um, Great Britain uh, at the beginning of the round robins and in the preliminary regatta, they they looked a bit weak. Uh, and they, the old America's Cup adage, you know, you just got to keep developing, improving the boat. And my word, have they done that to that boat? They've turned a boat from being a bit average. And, um, you know, through the round robin, they beat Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli twice. Um, and they probably, Luna Rossa, are still equal favourites with Ineos. I, I'm picking probably that will be the, the final of the Louis Vuitton Cup. On the downs, on the downward spiral would be American Magic. They went into this as sort of joint favourites with Luna Rossa, and they've, they've had issues. The, the boat looks quite fast but it it has a few um has a few issues um if you think back i think we talked about it before with you marty they um they've got these recumbent cyclists so the instead of cyclors being on bikes that they're actually sitting down in the bilge of the boat uh, what that has enabled them to do is to make the boat a bit smaller than all the other boats but they're paying a dear dear price in terms of their uh, their ability to generate hydraulic pressure, and and they have been exposed through the round robins. Can they rectify that? That'll be something to look out for. Um, fourth, uh, it will be um, Alinghi. 
Um, they are a new team here, um, but I think Alingi will be on the back foot through the, the semi-finals. I just don't think they've done enough. So you reckon it's going to be a, a Brit versus Luna Rossa, which is, you know, and we've, we've, we, uh, why do I feel like we've had one eye on Luna Rossa the whole way through this? Oh, well, because they've got the pedigree, you know, they've, they've been, uh, they, they challenged obviously in Auckland and did a damn good, damn good job. Remember after six races, it was three all, and especially in the light conditions. Um, their weakness is probably, uh, they haven't been getting off the start line very well and, and Ineos, in the last two races, has really started well. Um, will it be them? The, the dark horse probably now is American Magic, if they can get over their hydraulic issues. And and also, um, Paul Goodison, one of their helmsmen, he, he had an accident, and uh, the, the rumour mill is it's um, broken ribs. And and if that's the case, whether he can get back out on the water, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, why have they been so tight-lipped about that? Is it because they're embarrassed about how the accident happened? No, I don't, I don't know. It's, it seems a bit odd to me. I, I always think if you've got an issue, just come out, tell you know, tell the media what's going on, be honest, and and of course then things settle down very yes, quickly, yes. like what happened with Emirates Team New Zealand when they dropped the boat in the cradle. But the Americans seem to be playing this coy game and... Um, but the rumour mill up here is that, that Paul Goodison, who's a damn good bloke and a, a great yachty, is quite badly injured. So what do, what do we do between now and then? Well, what, yeah, what do they do? That You've got to keep developing the boat. You, the old adage is you've got to keep developing the boat, making the boat faster until the last race of the America's Cup. And that's where the New Zealanders will be now. Uh, the round robin, being able to compete in the round robin, I think is huge for them because it gives them a benchmark. Now they go off on their own and they can trick the boat up. And and all the talk I'm hearing is that they've got a fair bit of new kit to go on the boat, um, you know, from hydraulics to, to wings, um, maybe wing flaps, new sails, and, and just generally a good audit right over the boat. So I would expect when the New Zealanders come out and race one of the America's Cup on the 12th of October, they will be faster than what we saw uh, through the round robin stage. And, and they'll need to be. That, that, you know, that would be my rider because the challenges, especially, I think, uh, Ineos and Luna Rossa, Prada Pirelli, they're going to have one hell of a fight come the Louis Vuitton Cup final. Peter Lestris, with a couple more questions, I'll let you go. And thank you so much for your time as always, mate. Uh, you know, and look, I ask, I ask this, you know, some of the same questions every time because, you know, you've spent more weeks, more months there and you get to see. Just in terms of the contrast between our boat, is there anything that you have learned looking at our boat that, that you, when you and me were looking at it being put in the water months ago and, 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 and at the viaduct, is there, is there anything again that you've learned and go, oh, OK, right, well, that explains this. This is new. I get this bit now. I think what's um, the, the difference between the New Zealand boat and the others and the challenges right now would be, funnily enough, probably the low speed manoeuvres. Now, you might say, how the hell can you <laughs> win a, lot, a yacht race with low speed manoeuvres? Where it becomes important is, is pre start. And, and if you look at the New Zealand boat, they can keep the boat on the foils at a lower speed, in my opinion, than the challenges. Now, that gives you a, a, the opportunity in pre-start to actually take the other boat off the foils. So that control of the New Zealand boat in terms of low-speed foiling has really impressed me, and I think it's a point of difference. The other thing that I've noticed is the New Zealand boat is really manoeuvrable. So if you look at the boat upwind or downwind, tacking and jibing, how the boat will um, A, get on the foils very easily, but all, also its rate of acceleration from attack or a jibe, how quickly it gets back up to target speed. I think that's where their biggest um, strength is at the moment is, is, is in terms of any manoeuvre they do, in my opinion, they're making time on the opposition as they come out of attack or out of a jibe they could make as much as half a boat length each wow. manoeuvre. Yeah, that's and significant. Th and that's, yeah. that's yeah. significant. Yeah, that's is. significant. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full.
Here we go, here we go, here we go. Goal! Ben Wayne. I don't know how much he knew about that. American defender tries to clear the ball, hits him straight in the bonds, right in the face, and loops over the goalkeeper from the edge of the penalty area. But we will take it every day of the week. We can now play it in that second half. Hardly got a touch on the ball, but don't matter. What was the score in the end? Read it. One all. USA versus all whites. Miles, you would have loved it. We just got a draw against the United States. I don't care how we got it, mate. I'm celebrating. That's your whites that just did that. You know, it is. I mean, hey, you know, it's not like a World Cup or anything like that. But you've got to take those results when you get them. He only had about oh, third possession, I think, in the game. Created a couple of chances. Um, maybe not as, you know, the complete package that, that we're hoping for. But it is a step forward. And I think we've got to realise, I mean, the Yanks, although they've been a little bit off form of late, they're still up there in, in, um, in terms of world football. They've got amazing resources that um, the um, Major League Soccer is going from strength to strength. I mean, there's players coming out of that that are getting transferred over to Europe now. There's ageing players from Europe that are, that are going over there, but still you know, with a bit of um, energy in their legs. So, I, you know, I, I'll take it. I'll take it although we shouldn't get too carried away with it. I agree, but after the abject effort against Mexico, and what frustrated me so much about that was physically we didn't compete. We didn't want to go for the ball. We didn't want to go in for a 50-50 challenge. And all I want is us to be physically competitive before anything else. And so that was a big step up. Well, do you know, that's, that, I always find that bizarre, to be honest, because I don't know about you, but, but I mean, I'd love your opinion on this for once. For once? Um, I, <laughs> yeah, but I, I uh, not that I normally have to ask, you just butt in. But I, I find it strange that that should ever happen in, a, in an all-whites game because it, a lot of the players play in the A-League or have come through the A-League before they've gone on to Europe. And that, to me, is one of the most physical <laughs> leagues going. I mean, they, they let a hell of a lot go there yes, they do. that you wouldn't yeah. get away with in, in the top leagues in Europe. So it seems a bit strange that, you, um, that you'd be a bit reticent when it comes to playing an international game. Yeah, and, you know, we had friends in the stadium in Pasadena. They were really disappointed by it as well. Look, one thing that I just want us to do, we, look, you know, this is a team 94th in the world against a team that's normally in the, around the top 20. So we, there is a golf in class. We know all of that. But what we've got to do is just do the most basic things in football, which my United players aren't doing, which is just harangue, chase back, win a header. And that Ben Wayne goal is a classic case of that, Miles. That's just a guy following up. Look, it's the biggest monkey goal you'll ever see. But you take those because there are times that you don't get the break. And we, as you say, created a half chance. Right. But when the, when the guy's trying to make a clearance, it hits you in the face at the edge of the penalty area and loops in. I'm taking it every day of the week, mate. Uh, mate, the thing that gets me uh, about, you see, so many um, sides, West Ham under Moyes were classic at doing it, it, is sitting back and then dropping back and waiting for them and then packing the edge of the area and doing that. 30 years of coaching kids, I've always said to them, doesn't matter how good the team is we're playing, put them under pressure. You put them under pressure, they're liable to make mistakes. And I've, that works at every single exactly level right. of the game. Exactly right. and, and you've got to be, if you're so frightened, oh, they're going to be better than us, we'll just sit back. You know, you sit back against Manchester City and you, you're going to get power. Yeah, they'll copy your they six, They might mate. open mm. you up. But let them know they're in a game. Get stuck into them and, and, and put the squeeze, make them earn. Don't just let them knock. I mean, these guys are skilled. Don't let them just knock the ball around. Another thing, just while I'm on a rant, why don't people take a throw quicker? Yeah, you know? yeah, like, yeah. Honestly, yeah. Mate, you can't know, be, everyone, yeah. I used to get so my true. kids, honestly, I was in there, whatever it is, I said, as soon as you get there, grab the ball straight down the line. If your mate's not running, it's him that's, that's in the wrong, not you. And let's, you let's, know, and let's not remember... Down, people switch off. Yeah, and, and let's, off. Let's, let's not also forget, you can't be offside at a throw-in, OK? So that's the rule. So pick it up and just... You're right, have it down the line. A couple of football Get things to move line, on. Mate. Harry Kane, I think that's 68 goals and 100 appearances now for England. You were at his very first game with, with the two lads, the two youngest boys. <gasps> What are your thoughts on him? Because he's the top scorer for England, all of that. He's played 100 caps, but you've seen some fantastic centre forwards. And there's always, it seems to be, people who want to put an asterisk beside him. But I look at those figures and they just, mate, they're, that's, they're outrageous. Yeah, you, mate, Wayne Rooney suffered the same bloody thing. Record goal scorer at Man United, record goal scorer for England at the time. 
yeah, and, and still getting maligned all over the place. Same with Harry Kane. I think he's the record goal scorer. At, at, oh, I don't think he beat Jimmy Greaves, but anyway, he'd be there or thereabouts. He's going over a buy, and he had a re- rampant season last season. The guy's top quality. I mean, I don't want to compare him to, to other people, but his record speaks for himself. You're playing the international game. The international game now is probably tighter than it was in, in Bobby Charlton's uh, you know era or even Lineker's era. So, you know, his achievements are, are pretty decent. The, the thing with, with Kane is I hate his celebration. I think mean, it's the most, it's the lamest celebration going. But I don't think he should be captain. And I think the reason, because he's captain, I think that, that you know, he always plays... He plays in all the little games where normally you'd expect your main striker to be rested. And there may be an element of people thinking, well, you're He's just playing against yeah, you yeah. You know, you're, you're playing against Andorra, you're playing against Luxembourg, those sort of games you know, that he goes out and he knows he's going to pick up a couple of goals in them. But the goals that I've got to say, he isn't playing as deep as he did with um, under Southgate. And today, both his goals were re- were good goals, the second one particularly. So, you know, the, the boy's still got it. I don't think he was fit at the Euros, fully fit. There wasn't something quite right with him. And he had Southgate on his back, which doesn't help. So, uh, yeah, I, I'd rate him, and uh, I think his record speaks for himself. Prince Pond's time, then. And this wraps it up with Miles every Wednesday. All right, who's your Prince? I, I'm, I was tossed up, but I'm going to go for Harry Kane because he has copped a lot of stick um, and he keeps going. And I think today, now that he's playing more attack, well, today he proved that um, he's still worthy to be England's number nine. I've got a couple here, and they're both from the Shield Challenge game. Uh, Campbell Parata, who hit that 50-metre penalty on the angle, 47 on the angle, mate, clutch kick that young man to win the Shield. Plus also our old mate Angus Maybe, and that was his 100th first-class game that he was refing, Miles. Yeah, and he, he used to be my producer, you young go. Angus. And That's right. I taught him everything he knows. Everything. If you could deal with me, you could deal with any any rugby player when they start getting leery. So, yeah, well done to him. That's a good choice. I'll give you that. Ponce is who? Oh, Josh Adokar. Got to be. Like, there's, there's no one else. Front up, be a man about it, and just take it on the chin. I'm going for the whole. The I'm going for every single Wallaby that was there in the second half and disgraced that jersey with a record defeat against Argentina. Argentina were a good side. You won the test the week before, but being turnstiles, not wanting to tackle, and not wanting to be brave in that second half was a disgrace. The tight five. Five separate sporting topics, roughly a minute or so on each. Lachlan's on the buttons today. I've got nothing in the studio, so I can't play anything. So that's why it sounds a little bit clunky and a little bit confused and a little bit late on everything. Hey, 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 I'll stop on. you right there. Back, back, I back, work back. buttons, back but on. we work the buttons okay, together right, in right, tandem. Right. So right. when you take one half of it away, yeah, it's a bit tricky when all of the workload is on one person. Let's right. talk about the All Whites in that one all draw, mate. You happy with that? <laughs> Peter Lester, are we still winning this America's Cup? <laughs> the grounds crew in Uttar Pradesh. <laughs> Tyreek Hill, have you watched the am- the but what is it called? The body cam footage. Um and Mills Mulroney says a lack of competitiveness from the Aussie Super Rugby sides is a major factor behind the recent decline of the All Blacks. Ben Youngs, who played for the Lions in 2013, says they should cancel the tour next year because the Wallabies aren't good enough. <coughs> Kick it off with the All Whites, mate. Uh, I would have taken a one-all draw every day of the week in that, and I'll take a one-all draw every day of the week, and I don't care that we were outplayed, and I don't care that we were outpossessed, and I don't care that in the second half we hardly had a shot on goal. This is a game of football, and at the end of it, the only thing that matters, like against Slovakia in 2010, when Winston Reid got that header, is the result. And that is a damn good result for the All-Whites. That's all I'm saying. Agreed, absolutely. I mean, 17 shots to eight, five on target to three. I mean, five on target to three. We've got three. Well, we're five really on target. Mm. Uh, 67% position, which I think position's a bit of a, I don't think it's a totally accurate stat. Deceiving stat. stat. Yeah, deceiving. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, No, I mean, you you take a result like that against a team who are far better than you, especially when we're a side who underperform. Well, it feels like we underperform. Maybe we actually perform at the level we are, but we're we're disappointing more often than we are not. So, no, take that result, absolutely. I thought that we played Frady again. Uh, We don't seem to want the ball. When we've got the ball, we can't hold the ball. Chris Wood didn't get a look in all game. And, however, we did enough to compete physically to mean that we were still in the game. The great thing about football is you can stay in the game. 
Go back to the Champions League final of 1999 where Bayern Munich scored in the sixth minute. And then they hit the crossbar twice in the second half. And they dicked us the whole game up until the 91st minute and United scored two goals and won that trophy, right? That's what football is. That's what football can do. And for the All Whites, it's all about the confidence boost. If that was a World Cup match and that was a pool play match, every team in the world would take that result, right? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Absolutely. Enjoy the result, football fans in New Zealand. (laughs) Peter Lester. How cool was that, listening to that guy just after one o'clock? And how observational is he out there on the boat? You see, you don't get to see this on the TV, but that's what he was saying. He's looking at Team New Zealand and he's studying things. This is like Mark Larkham at the Supercars to me. Larko sees things that no one else sees because he's so into the sport at a level that it might be train spotting, it might be over obsession or anything. But I love the analysis because Peter's looking at that boat of ours and going, hang on a second, when we down gear, we're making gains that no one else is. We're getting a boat length out of this. How clever is that? Now, it's spectacular. It's something that you and I wouldn't pick up on. No. Uh, not at all. Never. And it hammers home the point that often is made on this show by people like yourself and Mark Watson, that when it comes to sports coverage, you need the experts in those fields. And you No, you don't. You need diversity, inclusivity oh, and equality. Yeah, yeah, it would be yeah, much yeah. better to have somebody on one of the, the Sky Sports sideline crew who's never been to America's Cup providing colour on the sideline for this coverage, wouldn't it? I was wrong, sorry. Yeah. yeah. But... Again, just further proves how important that knowledge is because I wouldn't have thought about that. And the fact when he said, it, I was like, oh, yeah, because I'm just assuming that we're faster based on top speed. There you and see, there's some is, technological I've, advancement in terms of how we've designed our boat that makes us better than I everyone have else. Never for a second thought you make gains going slow. And actually, it's quite nice because it's it's a bit like, for example, in a Formula One Grand Prix, if you can gain maybe half a second and over two pit stops, that turns into a second, and that proves vital in you winning a race. Uh, uh, in terms of a pit stop, that it wasn't so much down to that your car was quicker, that your pit crew were much mm-hmm. more efficient. It's yeah. a similar thing here. Our crew on the boat are so much quicker and more efficient when it comes to changing their duties, if that uh, if that makes he sense. He says manoeuvrability. Um, yeah. It's something now that, you know, I, I yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by this because it comes down to the finest of margins, doesn't it? And it also, he was, if you didn't hear the interview, um, it'll be available in the Highlights podcast around about 5.30 across all the platform sites, apps, and also the YouTube channel. But have a listen to Peter there. It's at the end of that interview, and he explains it really clearly. We can't, I, I, I can't explain it in a way that he explains it. He explains it succinctly and perfectly. Topic number three. The grounds crew at Uttar Pradesh at the Shahid Vijay Singh Patik Sports Complex. It's a mouthful. And the poor blokes who, you know, out there trying to dry this outfield, which is absolutely sodden. Rahul will be all over this for us in about uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, at first, uh, you know, I'm, I'm laughing. I'm, th- I'm watching the telly. I'm, th- I'm thinking it's a comedy show. You couldn't write a script like this. I mean, this is out of utopia, that Australian program. We're out of the games. We've got a test cricket happening, and there's a guy holding a fan over the grass trying to dry it out before play starts. How did that actually happen, do you think? So one of the ground staff said, mate, anyone got a fan? Yeah, auntie's got a fan. Can you go get it? Oh, it's in her garage. Can you go get it? Go, comes back. Oh, no, house is locked. Oh, for God's sake. Can anyone else got one? Yeah, actually, I think there was one out the back, wasn't there, by the coffee machine. Can you go and get it? And so he gets it, brings it out to the middle of the ball. We need an extension cord, dickhead. It's in there. Oh, yeah. oh shit. Yeah. sorry. Okay, who's got an extension? I think Auntie's got one. Well, her garage is shut. Yeah. So by the time they fanny around and they get the cord, and there's a bloke standing there holding it above the grass, <laughs> trying to dry the outfield. And I'm looking at it going, it's quite a big area, the the, the cricket pavilion. Yeah. Um, Look, how much have you covered? Oh, half well, a square metre. I've done that little bit there. Yeah. How long have you been there? Oh, about half an hour. Yeah. Oh. Well, we play starts at 11. Yeah. Well, mm. how, well how, how much are you going to get dry? Mm. I don't know, maybe mm. just this sort of little area here next to the wicket. So it doesn't feel that dry anyway. Mm. Well, this is as fast as a fan can go. <laughs> so, and honestly, it's the, uh, you get sit there fans? and you go, surely not. They're doing their absolute best here, aren't they? Are we going to get any cricket today? Oh, God, let's hope so. Get something. Well, maybe, shouldn't, shouldn't it might there be just a finger, be a T20 game on the last day, mate. Well, shouldn't there be a finger pointed at the... Um, I don't know. The, the, the people who selected this ground. Well, no, because Afghanistan selected this That's ground. Selected they? this ground, yeah. They and chose yeah, it. Yeah. Shouldn't India or the BCCI have stepped and said, no, no, this ground doesn't drain well at all. You can't have well, this Okay, one. that's my only question about this. 
did somebody know that yeah. this is not sand based and Every time I walk along around this, it's water. There's a bunch of Indian billionaires in their lounge just laughing so hard because they kind of tried to set this all up and go and just say, uh, you fell for it. <laughs> Tyreek Hill and the body cam footage. If you haven't watched this, this is the Miami Dolphins superstar wide receiver who gave the cops a bit of attitude from the wheel of his car driving to the game. And they played Jacksonville on Monday. Yes, they did. Uh, he gets pulled up in his Ferrari. They ask him to, to wind the window down. He winds it back up. He's got tinted windows. Okay? Now, when you see the AMCAM footage, it is rough as guts, man. These cops get him out of that car and they throw him to the ground and they knee him and they put the knee in the back and they cuff him and everything else and it looks wild. And you're thinking there's no way in hell that those those police would get away with that here. Mm. Uh, it's a different set of circumstances when every car you stop in the country that you live as a police officer, there's a very good chance that the person in the car has a firearm and they might use it against you. So they act and behave in a way that I'm so glad that we don't live like that. Um, it looks terrible, actually. And at the same time, though, I keep thinking, when they stop the car, Tyreek, and they ask you to put your window down, if you'd just actually done what you were asked to do and complied... Would it have escalated to that? I'm not saying that the cops are right here and I'm not saying that the way they behaved is right, but I'm just saying that under the circumstances, surely... I was pulled over once, 1993, Indian State Freeway, leaving Texas, going into Oklahoma. And I made the mistake when the guy... Uh, first, I tried to get out of the car and he just gave me the big F, don't you F and get out of the car. The next minute, his gun's out and I would said, I'm from New Zealand, I'm just getting my passport, it's in the boot. And I lifted up the boot and he just went off about, get your effing hands where I can see them. And he had this cannon pointed right beside my head pretty much. And mm. it was the most freaky thing. But I understand though, because they can't take a chance because they take a chance and they lose their lives. It's as simple as that. They don't know who they're dealing with. Yeah. There could be some crackhead drug dealer driving a Ferrari. They don't bloody know, do they? And they are a country that unlike New Zealand, deals with a lot of serious, serious, serious incidents in a variety of cities and towns daily. Um, so they, they're trying to almost assume the worst. We talked about this a lot yesterday, but they're trying to assume, assume the worst. Because the yeah. they have to, because you're yeah. right. You never yeah. know. You could be pulling someone over, and if you let your guard down a little bit, they could just pull out a gun and shoot you. They could, you know, tackle you or take your car or something. Mm -hmm. So it's not that Tyreek Hill did anything absurdly, terribly wrong, and the cops were totally in the right. Both were in the wrong in their own way. I think both are in the wrong. But I, the thing I don't like is how the Miami Dolphins have released a statement. A lot of their players have said things. Uh, Tyreek Hill himself uh, had a had a presser, I think, after the game oh, he's had on three. Monday. He's had three he's had now. Three, there mm -hmm. you go. And there's a lot of uh, American sports media people posting about this on their social media. A lot of them are turning it into a bit of a race thing, which is, I don't think it's quite that. Uh, but everyone's acting like, you know, Tyreek Hill did absolutely nothing wrong. It's totally the fault of the police officers. I, it's it's not as... Uh, Keep your window down, answer the questions. Yeah. Get well, out of the car the when, they ask you to, when they ask follow you to get the out of the instructions. car. Final topic. Mills Molyainia says, Mills Molyainia says, a lack of competitiveness from the Australian super rugby sides is a major factor behind the recent decline of the All Blacks. Is he right? Uh, partially. I don't, it's not, it doesn't, it's like he's blaming Australian super rugby sides. It's not their fault. Uh, it's the fault of the breakdown of what super rugby was and really the breakdown of the relationship with South Africa. And um, I don't really know if we could have prevented them from leaving, but um, we sort of waved them goodbye quite happily. That's the reason, uh, but that's not the only reason no, that's again. that's not the only reason. I mean, why don't you say it out loud, Mills? Our players aren't good enough. Now, you can come up with a million reasons as to why they're not good enough. Maybe they don't practice enough. Maybe they don't actually go out there and practice enough. Maybe that they're just a, at a level that that's as good as they get and that's the level they're at. They're not legendary All Blacks. Maybe it's a little bit to do with the fact that Super Rugby isn't as competitive. Well, how about letting them play Super Rugby then instead of resting them every Two games. Yeah, it's interesting how people say this, that the standard of the competition isn't, uh, you know, n not us, uh, but the standard of the competition isn't good, but then they, they'll happily see them, like I guess Mills is sort of insinuating this here, they'll happily see them rest matches. Yeah. It doesn't really... And never say you know, a word about it. So, yeah. you know, I don't think that's, the, that's the, the only factor, and I don't think we can blame Australia, but what about just tacking on to the end of that when Ben Young's the ex-Lion says, hey... Um, that the Lions shouldn't tour there next year. He said, we're going to dick all their super sides by 50. We're going to win the first two tests by 110 combined points. What's the bloody point? Oh, I'd love that to come back and bite you, boy. I'd love that to yeah, come back. Yeah, he's got a point, but at the same time, if that's, I don't know, if that's the truth, why do you have any issue going down there? Do what you're going to say you're going to do then.
Yeah, beat, go down beat, there and beat them up them. in all three That's tests. It. Yeah, win all the super tests. Yeah. Win that Anzac what, test Lions, as well. The Lions have only won, I think, two two times they've ever been touring. I think they've only won. They beat us in 1971. No, three. Us in 1971. They beat. They beat Australia in 2013. They beat Australia in 1989, and they beat the Springboks in 1997. Well, I think. Yeah. Okay. They, well, they've toured about 30 times or yeah. 20 times. I mean, they're the only four times they've ever won. The ATM Podcast, the Apologise to Me Podcast, Mark Watson, episode 99. Mark just back from the Paralympics. We're talking about that. Plus, the White Ferns have been named to go to the T20 World Cup. This is comical. This is the same team that lost eight in a row in England gets selected to go on another jaunt because that's what it is. No one takes this team seriously, do they? I mean, not in terms of being a professional sports side. They're just there to have fun, aren't they? As long as the culture's good and the girls are happy, all of that kind of stuff, and they earn a huge amount of money. There's $10,000 in match bonuses waiting for them, even whether they win or lose. There's no consequence at all to their performance. What I The Paralympics, a couple of quick questions. I want to know what was your best moment, what was your best story, what, what, what moved you the most? Oh, look, I, I, I'll still say this. I think that the thing that just impressed me the most was just the crowds that turned up and got behind this event. Uh, look, I, I went to Parc de France. It was only a couple of train stops from where we were staying um, on Friday night. I had I'd done the cycling all day, and I had the night off. And you know, I, I, I'm not Marty. You might actually be able to confirm the capacity of that stadium, but it is large. And I would say it was 90% full. I mentioned last week the atmosphere in the basketball arena every night was 12,000 sellout. And I think it was just the crowds that moved me the most. How people just embraced these athletes. Um, I mean, the triathlon's always um, something really special to watch with the different categories, watching people having to swim in the Seine River over 750 metres who have no use of their lower limbs or legs and, you know, having to try and somehow keep their bodies upright in a technique-based sport and then being lifted out of the water and put onto their hand cycles and, you know, then they come off and then they've got to be lifted into their wheelchairs for the wheelchair side of it, which is the equivalent to the run. And then you watch the athletes with maybe a higher a lesser degree of impairment and they're coming out of transition and they're putting on their, you know, their, their um, various sort of um, prosthetics and uh, and the engineering around that. Um, yeah, and then just, 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 just the stories really around, I think Rory Mead, even a New Zealand cyclist, you know, used to be a, a, an international motocross uh, bike rider and then clearly an accident puts him in a wheelchair and, yeah, but through the Paralympic movement have found some purpose and have found that drive and have found that sense of self-worth and that sovereignty that I guess they felt they would never get back after their accident. And I think that's probably the story of it. But I think the one thing you notice, Martin, when you're commentating at that level, once the race gets underway, you don't even notice a lot of the time the actual impairments. You're not actually, you're just calling a race. Yeah, yeah. And you pretty quickly don't see that this guy here does have a prosthetic or this particular person here um, doesn't have movement down one side you have just seen a race and you're just talking about the race and you're doing it like you're doing any you're doing it like you did the road race at the olympic games in tokyo and there's this excitement and there's the tactical side of it and the technical side of it and you know the countries and the people out on the roads and you know and these yeah and i think i think that's the thing that um i probably didn't enjoyed the most and probably resonated with me the most but also I think just the depth that we're seeing every four years we've just got greater depth in the fields now um, there's more and more athletes clearly who have been inspired by the generation four to take up a particular sport and so there's greater depth of competition um, and the margins for first through to fourth are becoming smaller and smaller. The White Ferns, who lose eight matches in a row in England, exactly the same squad is now going to go and play the T20 World Cup. Uh, they've got England and they've got Australia in their group. They're not getting out of the group. They, you know, they've got Sri Lanka and Pakistan. They might win one game. Again, massive salaries, you know, business class airfares, five-star lifestyle, no consequence at all about results for this team. As long as they're giggling, having fun, and they're wearing a silver fern, that's yep. all that matters. And, you know, and you sit there and you go, but you've just created this pizza for yourself, New Zealand cricket. These women know this. They're on a carpet ride now. This is a laugh. This is the, the, They have got the easiest job out of any job in New Zealand. They turn up and there's no consequence whatsoever to how, how they play or what their results are. They're getting massive salaries for basically having a good time. As is it blows me away, this is. It's professional sport. 
Yeah, well, minimum salary for those girls is $120,000 yes, before all the yeah. match fees and everything yeah. else comes in. Right. As I've said, mate, they're club athletes who have been elevated to the status by a left-wing feminist media uh, to being somehow perceived as being elite athletes and that this is all warranted and this is all justified and that their place in New Zealand sport stands alongside of the Hadleys and the Coneys and all of those great players that have gone before them. And the media need to stop doing this. The media have started to stop elevating these um, sports teams and trying to somehow make them out to be bigger and better than they deserve of everything they've got. I mean, it's an absolute joke. I mean, isn't it interesting? You see Hayden Wild at the Olympic Games, one of the great races, comes up silver, doesn't make any excuses, and three weeks later he's back on the circuit. Yeah, he's having to Incredible. win races it's because it. he's trying it because he to needs to earn money. Yeah, yeah. He wants to try and earn a dollar. He wants to make a living. He generally wants to try and set himself up. There's no guarantees. If he doesn't perform, he doesn't get paid. And they're out there toiling away. You know, our rowers would have come home to nothing. Um, you know, they'll be back out on the water now looking for the next four-year campaign. You know, we've got a group group of women's cricketers who can't catch, can't throw, can barely bloody bowl um, in one of the biggest minority sports in New Zealand in terms of the women's cricket. Cricket's not a minority sport, but it's predominantly a men's game. I'll keep saying this. As long as we continue to just elevate everybody, and we've talked about you know this also happening in the media, but as long as we continue to elevate these people to the highest level in this economic, where you know where women just have to be on par, and you know there's no expectation, then we're going to continue to get the same results. Exactly right. You know, I'm, I, I, it's interesting though, isn't it? I'm still waiting to see the big. Where was the hard hitting reporting being done on the Poor performance of this women's cricket team after eight consecutive losses. It in wasn't England. there. It'll never be done. It'll never be done. It'll never be done. No, no, no. The only <laughs> reporting will be criticising people like you and me who bring it up. This guy is a true Iron Man. Aaron Gate, New Zealand Sportsman of the Year, 2023. Four Commonwealth Games gold medals hanging around his neck after 2022. He's got a bronze from the 2012 Olympics. And fifth, fifth and fourth at the recent Paris Olympics. Gutted about that. But... Dream come true. At 33 years old, he has now got a job with Astana, Kazakhstan, one of the major teams that compete on the Grand Tours. That's France and that's Spain and that's Italy. This guy is just an iron horse. And that's what his job is going to be, to get somebody else over the finish line first. Here's Aaron. How kind of life-changing is this for you? Um, oh, it's... Uh... It's pretty cool. Like I, I needed a goal beyond beyond the Olympics, and I was lucky enough to um, have been talking with the team for some time and managed to pin a deal just be, just before the games kicked off. So I mean, it was yeah. The, you can also suffer regardless of you win or lose going to the Olympics. It's the the post Olympic blues is definitely a thing for a lot of people. And you know, when you've got something to look beyond that, it was um, nice to sort of have that in the back of my head too. Um, something beyond the the Olympic rush and um, yeah, it's just something to look forward to, I suppose. I want to come back to that um, because that's really significant that you've actually mentioned that. Um, the, when I say the Astana Kazakhstan team, does that mean that you have to go to Kazakhstan? <laughs> uh, well, I've got an email recently about uh, the first team building camp at the end of October, but location yet to be determined. And right. I've heard all sorts of stories about previous um boot camps and whatnot that have been run in the past for team building so not sure yet but um but no it's 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 one of those things where the world tour has teams registered in different countries all around the world and a lot of the team base is actually out of um italy and luxembourg i believe so there's kind of yeah vehicle registration plates from all over the show and it's like the the world tour is kind of the traveling circus of of cycling um with and they've also got a new Chinese sponsor um, coming on board too, so there'll be a lot of um, influence from from further east too. So it'll be a, an interesting dynamic next year. But I'm um, yeah, kind of looking forward to the the opportunity. Still a lot of very multinational team looking at the roster. So yeah, it's um, it's going to be a bit of a change, but um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. God, that's global, isn't it? I mean, just, you just rattled off about five or six countries there. So so who else is actually on the team then, as far as as far as your running mates? Um, a lot of fair few Italians, a um, few Kazakhstanis, of course, and um, yeah, Belgians, all sorts. So it's um, yeah, it is it is very multinational. I I believe the 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 core language is English at least. So it's a, a step forward somewhat from from this year, where I was sort of a a deer in the headlights sometimes in the team meetings and full Espanol, um, trying my best to understand where the, <laughs> where the water and feed points were and what the team tactics were for the day. So it's um, at least that will hopefully be 
an easier step forward, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> What's your role, Aaron? What do they want you to do? Um, I sort of fill the. I mean, my main role is going to be supporting the the bunch sprinters in the team. So that I bring from the track, I suppose, like sort of a sustained high power, uh, which is quite suitable to you know keeping the the sprinters out of the wind in that crucial last final kilometre leading into the sprint, so they can unleash their last effort towards the line um, from from a good position. And then also like an important part of a lot of team seasons is the early classics they're called um, in Northern Europe, racing in the in the foul conditions of Belgium and and Northern France um, in the early part of the season, and then hopefully get to another get another Grand Tour under my belt too um, at some point in the year. And yeah, and then also it kind of it kind of helps now. Just I've had some recent success in, in China and with the new Chinese sponsor on board. I think they'll be looking to me to to go to some of those Asian races too to put my best foot forward with with the squad. Aaron Gates is with us. He is signed for Astana, Kazakhstan. Uh, so he'll be on the Grand Tours. So you're doing you're doing the tight five work. Let's just put it in all black terms here, right? I mean, you're doing the dark art stuff. You're you're down there in those trenches where they basically you win the ball and you give it to the frilly guys out the back line, right? <laughs> that's that's the one. It tends to be a role that us Kiwis are attracted to. I'm not sure why, but um, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's it's quite rewarding as well when you when you work with a with a team that you know has a common goal and you're a, a key part of that key cog in that machine. I've I've been to a few teams where you kind of all just end up riding around. I mean, in my early days, and you're just trying to all get to the finish line at, at some point, and you don't have that real direction and drive as, as a unit. Like uh, it's often. It goes by the wayside sometimes with how much of a, a team sport cycling really is, and um, it's kind of what makes it so enjoyable for me, for me as well. I find that fascinating, mate. Um, you know, I, I can't pretend to know you know huge amounts about it, but I, I I love that dynamic where and and where the guy that like wins the Tour de France or wins the Giro or whatever, and he turns around and he actually pays credit to the horses, mate. I mean, it's going to because you know you have to have all of these moving parts working together that's you, you know you can't win it on your own yeah no 100 percent. and i think it's it is it does feel like it's something that's quite unique to cycling as well like even with my current um spanish team burgos bh last week and in china i had the leaders jersey and when you've got the leaders jersey you're in a really tricky position because everyone looks at you to be the one well everyone's trying to attack you basically and get that jersey off your shoulders and i had you know this this team of people from all over the world we had i had one fellow kiwi there and george jackson but we had a bloke from uruguay a bloke from spain um the staff were you know we got a mechanic that doesn't speak any english from cuba plus an australian swan looking after us you know it's <laughs> really you do end up in, with some pretty odd situations uh in cycling and you know you got to um yeah, I guess it just keeps life interesting. <laughs> well, and just the psychology of that, when you're wearing that jersey, I mean, that changes everything that day, doesn't it? That stage, when you're wearing that jersey. Yeah, it does. And I think a, a special moment for me was also winning a, another stage in that jersey because that's um, definitely something that's not easy to do where you've got everyone's eyes looking at you and, and your every move and... Um, that was something that was quite cool and again you know it was a position I couldn't have been in without the team looking after me and reeling the breakaway back in before the sprint finish and everything they have to do and you know you end up getting to the finish line the freshest out of everyone in the whole team because you've just had to look after yourself and be prepared to defuse any last minute situations but when the team does it well you actually have the easiest ride of the, of the day. <laughs> to hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. That's our podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to listen to the entire show, one to four, Monday to Friday, download the Platform app. And via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to whatever shows over however many weeks at your leisure, at your listening pleasure. Platform Plus. First thing to do, though, is download the platform app. Devlin. Unbelievable. Incredible. The platform. It's only sport with Martin Devlin on the platform. Brought to you by One New Zealand. Let's get connected.